I was prescribed, and like most people are prescribed, they're given a prescription drug that will reduce the symptoms of it, of each of those diseases. And then I was given basically offhand comments about, oh, maybe you should exercise more, you know, for hypertension, avoid salt, don't eat a lot of uh, purines or certain types of uh, uh, compounds like that. But really the, the main emphasis was on the treatment with these prescription drugs. And what I, what I found as I began reading more and more is that the drugs I was given really just treated the symptoms for the disease. In other words, the, the anti-hypertension or the high blood pressure medicines lowered my blood pressure, but they didn't do anything about the underlying pathology in the vessels. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button, you punch that, and it's gonna notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. That's gonna walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode, and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore metabolic health, our bone health, and lies he taught in medical school is Dr. Rob Lufkin. In addition to being a practicing physician, he is author of over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers and 14 books that are available in six languages. Robert has given and invited lectures, keynotes around the world, and was named one of the 100 most creative people in Los Angeles by Buzz Magazine. His latest book, Lies I Taught in Medical School, is coming out in June 2024. You will want to grab a copy of this book. His honors include serving as president of the Society of Magnetic Resonance Imaging, president of the American Society of Head and Neck Radiology, and numerous other professional affiliations. Among his many inventions, including several patents in artificial intelligence, he developed an MR-compatible biopsy needle, which is used worldwide today as the Lufkin needle. Robert studied computer science at Brown University and completed his medical degree at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He is currently adjunct clinical professor of radiology at the USC Keck School of Medicine with an academic focus on the applied science of longevity. He is also chief of metabolic imaging at a large medical network in Southern California. Dr. Robert Lufkin, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin, it's so great to be here. I want to say, first of all, I'm a huge fan of yours, uh, both of yours as, as well as the podcast, your podcast, and uh, I'm thrilled to be on it. This is the first time, so uh, I, can't, I can't wait. This is going to be fun. I'm excited for it, too, and this is going to be a great, a great interview. You've got a fantastic book that's on the way out, and uh, I'm looking forward for everybody. You'll be able to find that book in the show notes, too. We'll make sure we link down to it. Uh, but let's let's jump into the interview and talk about uh, that. That is a pretty uh, thought provoking title. Lies I taught in medical school, and I'm sure that really draws people in. Maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about your journey in medicine, from your education to becoming a fully tenured professor and a leader in medical organizations. Yeah, and and before I do that, just the the whole concept of lies I taught in medical school. It is sort of an audacious title. It's sort of clickbait a little bit for people who aren't aware. But the very nature of medical education and several great scholars in medical education have uh, made the point that fifty percent of what we what we teach and what we learn in medical school will be dead wrong within five years. And the problem is we don't know which half it is. So. Yes, I did teach lies in medical school, and they're still being taught by myself and others. And the the idea is that science is continually evolving, and we need to continually re-examine re-examine re things. So, uh, for my journey, I started off. Um, I, my mom was a dietitian, so I was I was immersed in. Uh, uh, what to eat kind of we followed religiously we followed the food pyramid and we we uh, assiduously avoided uh, saturated fat and butter and cholesterol we we substituted uh, 
margarine full of trans fats and seed oils for for butter. We uh, we avoided uh, fats like saturated fats. We avoided eggs, and that's how I, that's how I lived my life. I got interested in medicine through this experience, and I went to medical school. Was fortunate enough to uh, stay on and and faculty, and and basically I, I spent my career at at major teaching hospitals in Southern California. And I'm still there. Uh, the, the great thing about being at a teaching hospital is I was able to spend like a third of my time doing research and a third of my time uh, practicing medicine. So I actually got to see patients and actually walk the walk. And then the last third was perhaps the most valuable for me as I got to teach residents and, and doctors in training and other healthcare professionals, but it wasn't just teaching them. It was what they taught me by the questions they asked. And I oftentimes learned more, I think, than I taught them from the whole experience. But that's that's kind of my beginning story, uh, how I got how I got involved in medicine and wound up as a as a professor at at these medical schools. And maybe you could tell us about your own health journey too. Was there anything along the way in, in your own health that you realized there needed to be some changes or maybe you needed to do things differently or maybe you just wanted to investigate it so you could live longer and better? <laughs> Great question. Well, I was, you know, I was, I was uh, a medical, I am a medical school professor. So I was doing everything I thought was healthy uh, for myself and for my family. And then suddenly I developed four seemingly unrelated chronic diseases. Um, and these diseases, as it turns out, were uh, similar diseases that my father had gotten, but my and my father eventually died of one of them, but he was almost 90 years old when he died. And when I came down with these diseases, I still had two daughters in elementary school. And knowing what I know about those diseases and medicine, this wasn't going to end well. So I, I went to my doctors and was prescribed uh, prescription medicines for, for each of these conditions, which I thought would, you know, which I assumed would take care of them. And I followed their instructions diligently. The diseases were um, hypertension, which almost half of adult Americans have. Um, pre-diabetes, which means my, my blood sugars were high and I was trending towards type 2 diabetes. I had a lipid abnormality in my blood, uh, abnormals there. And then I had a, a bone problem with gout or a type of arthritis where my joints, where my joints hurt. And um, as a result of the, the, coming down with all those, I began to uh, question the conventional wisdom. And I began reading and looking at research and kind of going outside my own field and talking to people. And I suddenly realized that um, maybe the approach that had been rec recommended to me by conventional medicine wasn't the best approach. And that that approach was, was that prescription drugs, you know, for the treatment of chronic diseases? And, you know, what did you find in your own research and personal experience that that kind of helped lead your teaching today and maybe even you as a medical professional? Yeah, for each of these diseases, like I was, I was prescribed and like most people are prescribed, they're given a prescription drug that will reduce the symptoms of it, uh, of each of those diseases. And then I was given basically offhand comments about, uh, oh, maybe you should exercise more, you know, for hypertension, avoid salt, uh, you know, for, for gout, you know, don't eat a lot of uh, purines or certain types of uh, uh, compounds like that. But but really, the the main emphasis was on the treatment with these prescription drugs. And what I what I found as I began reading more and more is that um, the drugs I was given really just treated the symptoms for the disease. In other words, the the anti hypertension or the high blood pressure medicines lowered my blood pressure, but they didn't do anything about the underlying pathology in the vessels. Similarly, with the gout, uh, the the drugs I was given for that changed the bone so that I didn't have pain in the joints, but they didn't affect the underlying disease process. And same with all the others. And what I realized is. Rather than being four separate diseases, these chronic diseases were linked at a very fundamental level to our metabolism. And this has been overlooked. I had overlooked it. And still, many of my colleagues today 
overlook this in the teaching of of medical in medical school even as of 2023 so i began to look at ways to change the metabolism and address these conditions and as it turns out by changing our lifestyle it's possible to change our metabolism and affect not only these four chronic diseases but lo and behold a whole list of diseases. In fact, the major diseases that determine our longevity, things like cancer, heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, even mental health, have a very strong dependency on these on these uh, basic metabolic conditions. And the, the, the challenge here is there's no pill for metabolism to make our metabolism better. It's about lifestyle and Fortunately, by changing our lifestyle, we can dramatically rework our metabolism to literally prevent or even reverse many of these chronic diseases. And if that's the key, why is there not as much of an emphasis on that in the medical profession, in that conventional medical model? Well, part of it is uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of inertia in medicine. In other words, uh, things change slowly. Part of it is uh, modern medicine is very specialized. There are silos. In other words, the endocrinologist who may know about diabetes uh, may not be familiar with Alzheimer's disease, although we're learning that that Alzheimer's disease is linked to glucose metabolism, and some people now call it type 3 diabetes. The cardiovascular specialist who looks at the looks at the heart and the blood vessels of the heart may not be familiar with insulin metabolism and other things. And the and the rheumatologist, the bone specialist who who looks at the gout, may not be familiar with the metabolic nutritional aspects of it. So part of it is just the information isn't getting out as it should. But this is really revolutionary. It's a game changer. And it, it can literally save people's lives. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to take one more minute to talk about if you are somebody who was newly diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, and you're at a point where you're stressed, you're worried, you're overwhelmed, you have no idea where to start or how to get started getting confident in your plan. I want to tell you about the Stronger Bone Solution Program. Over 5,000 people have come through this Stronger Bone Solution Program, and it walks you through the exact process you need to fill in the missing pieces, uncover critical things in your plan that you may not be aware of, and help you make modifications, adjustments, and tweaks to get you to the place where you're building stronger bones. I want you to get confident in your plan so that you can focus on living life and enjoying the life that you deserve with the people you love most. So if that's where you wanna be, head over to bonecoach.com forward slash apply and apply for our Stronger Bone Solution program right now. I'm Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to see you inside this program. I want to help you get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. Hope to see you inside very soon. Let's get back to the episode. And are there, you talked about, you mentioned eggs and saturated fat and a couple other things, you know, that you learned following that food, food pyramid uh, growing up. And so many of our listeners, I'm sure are, are like, okay, I heard that too. I still hear that today. Are there examples of dietary guidelines that are still present today that you believe are maybe harmful? Is or are there any of those that you maybe think? Yeah, are, no? ab absolutely. Eggs are one of the healthiest healthiest foods we can eat. Um, um, but I, I was just at a restaurant uh, with my young daughter, and she says, "Daddy, why are there omelets? Why are there egg white omelets?" <laughs> and I said, "Well." People used to believe that the yolk in the egg, which contained all the cholesterol, that the cholesterol was somehow harmful. Fortunately, that is not true, and it's accepted even by the American Heart Association. Yet, many people and and some physicians don't don't still recognize that, and they advise people to limit their cholesterol intake. When we know dietary cholesterol has no impact on blood cholesterol. So that's that's one factor. The other factor is the common diet and the basis of the food pyramid, which was the public health recommendations in the United States and really around the world for the last 50 years are based on the idea that saturated fats are harmful and that a low fat diet is healthy. And this has fostered a whole revolution in 
processed junk foods, which contain high carbohydrates, high seed oils, and a lot of pro-inflammatory grains. And our diets have shifted to this carbohydrate heavy junk food, which in my opinion, drives the, the, all the chronic diseases we're, we're facing, starting with obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, et cetera, including the four diseases I had. Yeah. And I mean, special interests obviously seem like they have a, a, an influence on health guidelines. How do you think this is affecting medical research and the, the trustworthiness of scientific studies? Well, yeah, it's 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 a problem. I think you know. I think basically, humans, physicians, uh, and healthcare workers were honest, no, honest, and have good intentions. Nobody wants to hurt anybody, and you know, give the wrong advice. But but there are pernicious financial incentives that drive this. the The whole idea of one of the the best selling pharmaceutical drugs ever made is a class of drugs called statins, which lower LDL cholesterol. And LDL cholesterol is one of the things that was targeted for reducing heart disease. And heart disease is the number one killer. So the problem is the LDL cholesterol that, that the statins take care of isn't the main driver of heart disease, although it's it's the main, the main drug that be, can be prescribed. So there's this incentive for doctors to prescribe statins because it's something they can do. It's something they can they can affect to help manage the heart disease. When patients go in, they want pills. They demand pills. They don't want advice about what to eat or, you know, changing their lifestyle. Partly because it's confusing. Partly because they don't they don't realize how significant it is and how it's e probably even more powerful than the drugs they're getting. But also the fact that the doctors don't have time in the modern healthcare system to fully explain lifestyle changes. It's much easier to write a quick prescription for a pill. Yeah, I, I would totally agree um, with with that. Even from the people that we work with that come to us and tell us that's that's really their experience to uh, that they've had with, with some of those conversations with their physicians. If we're talking about having healthy metabolic function, where does a person start? Right. If yeah. Are there specific tests we need to be looking at? Are there specific uh, areas or regions of the body that we're supposed to be looking at to really focus on improving those areas? I mean, maybe walk us through that a little bit. Absolutely. But if I could um, back up one more thing about pernicious incentives. Um, type 2 diabetes is um, it's a worldwide epidemic that we've never seen uh, this many people or even this percentage of people in the history of the world. And type 2 diabetes is a problem. It's driven by insulin resistance, but the problem is it leads to heart disease. It leads to Alzheimer's disease. It leads to higher risk of cancer. And if you go, it, type 2 diabetes is caused by carbohydrate toxicity, eating too many carbs. Uh, if, if you lower the amount of carbs or even cut out carbs entirely in your diet, for most people, the type two diabetes will reverse and you will go off all medications. Now, if you go to a hospital and ask the hospital administrator or the owners of the hospital, I say, hey, we have a plan to get you know, your patients off, cure their type two diabetes or put it into remission you know, that's great news, but it's going to involve a diet. They're not set up for diets. It's easier to prescribe insulin or metformin. But then there are other things in the back of their mind. One of the number one surgical indications is amputations. They keep the, sur keep the ORs full. And the number one cause of amputations today is diabetes. They're, renal failure and dialysis units generate money for the hospital, the number one fail, the number one cause of renal failure today and source of uh, dialysis and renal transplants is type two diabetes. In fact, the the largest dialysis makers are heavy funders of the American Diabetes Association, <laughs> which recommends uh, eating foods that contain a lot of sugars rather than eliminating sugars completely from their diet. So there are these incentives. The number one cause of blindness is uh, is diabetes, a retinal disease. Uh, 
So it's tricky. It's they're they're both conscious and unconscious pernicious disincentives about about uh, moving in what I believe is the right direction as far as lifestyle. Yeah, and that's incredibly frustrating for that end person who's just trying to get well. They're coming, they're putting their faith into a system that is really not designed to help them achieve their best possible health outcome. And that's why sometimes people have to go outside of the conventional medical model and seek out you know, more functional medicine approaches, getting to the root cause of issues and really acknowledging diet, lifestyle, exercise, all those other pieces play a major role in your health. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and another thing that I became aware of that I wasn't aware of before was, um, I mean, I used to think of diabetes, you know, it's a disease, obviously, and that, you know, some people get it, some people don't get it, you know, and, you know, if you're lucky, you don't get it. And if you're unlucky, you do get it. Uh, my thinking's changed on that a little bit. Um, diabetes is, uh, it's measured by your, your, the diagnostic criteria is your uh, blood glucose levels or your fasting glucose levels or another marker called hemoglobin HA1C, which is similar to that. And when you cross a certain threshold, you become diabetic. Your diagnosis, oh, you're a diabetic now. And if if you're below the threshold, you're not a diabetic. And that's just the nature of, of medicine. We have to have a an on and off switch really for, for insurance purposes and diagnostic purposes. But the reality is the blood glucose begins to be abnormal years to even decades before you actually become diagnosed as a diabetic. And it's interesting, if you look at the adult population of non-diabetics in the United States from large studies, the the markers for diabetes or the markers for prediabetes increase with age. So in other words, the older we get, the more of this, what's called insulin resistance we develop and the more elevated our glucose becomes. So that now my thinking about type two diabetes, it's sort of like, you know, gray hair. If you, if you live long enough and you don't die of something first, you probably you will become type two diabetic. It's just it's it's one of those things that you get. So how does that influence uh, influence my thinking now? Well, most people, you know, arguably all people, but at least most people should think about that with their dietary choices. Even though, hey, I'm not diabetic, I'm not diagnosed with diabetes, but I'm on the path there, as we all are. So we might want to think about doing some of the things that make us more metabolically healthy and more and less vulnerable to type two diabetes, which is kind of the number one metabolic disease that, that we face. So you asked about kinds of things we can do on lifestyle. Um, the, the number one thing you can do with lifestyle is nutrition. And, and that's, that's the biggest, the biggest mover on the needle. Um, it's it's probably it's the one medicine that everybody on the face of the earth since the beginning of time takes every single day unless they're fasting or something. So it's something that we get to choose every day when we wake up. We get to make a choice about what we put in our mouth. So my plan, what I what I began doing to to fight these four diseases instead of just relying on the prescriptions, I looked at I looked at um, the factors of, that what nutrition would do and. One thing, one thing I started with, I didn't change anything I ate at all, but I just did the simple thing of narrowing the eating window. So instead of eating all day long, waking up, eating, then snacking, then eating and having dinner, snacking some more, just narrow the window. That in itself will make people more metabolically healthy. Just don't eat all the time. <laughs> uh, and it turns down inflammation and it turns... Uh, improves insulin uh, sensitivity. The next thing I did was I uh, I looked at the number one driver for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, and that's insulin. It's a, it's a hormone they all, we all have. It's life-saving. It causes us to store fat. Of the three macronutrients that we all eat, you know, protein, fat, and carbohydrates, two are essential and one is non-essential. And only one of them significantly, really significantly drives insulin. And that's the non-essential one. That's the carbohydrates. So the first thing I did was I minimized carbohydrates in my diet and I just focused on fats and proteins and went to what's called a low carb diet. I went into ketosis, which is a healthy nutritional state. I narrowed my eating window to one meal a day of uh, 
when my kids get home, I have dinner with them typically. Uh, and then the other thing I did, I reduced uh, another inflammatory compound that's present in almost all junk foods that was just developed in the last century. And these are industrial seed oils. They have very healthy sounding names like vegetable oil or canola oil, or uh, there are a number of those. I removed those. Those are pro-inflammatory. And then the last thing I did was I um, removed grains from my diet. Now, I love I love baked goods. I love cake. I love donuts. I love bagels. All that stuff, I love it. But there's one thing I love more, and those are my kids. And I want to see my kids grow up. I want to see their grandkids. And I want to see their great uh, my great grandkids. You know, so um, I give up I give up grains. And I'm not gluten sensitive. I'm I don't have celiac disease, which some people have problems with grains. But I believe, it, and there's good evidence to show that. Um, all grains have an inflammatory component to them, the proteins in them, and they drive low-grade inflammation that that affects, it certainly affects me, but it affects many people and can cause problems. So even whole grains, I don't, I don't use. And then the final nail in the coffin with grains is, of course, in the United States, grains are soaked in an, an herbicide called glyphosate, which... Um, has been linked to cancer and many countries outlawed, but not the United States. But so those were the three three nutritional things that I did, and then then I did other things with sleep, exercise, and and stress as well. Yeah, those uh, diet, nutrition, stress, sleep; those are all major major drivers. Thanks for sharing your your personal journey there as well. Um, it's always good to hear how somebody went from having certain conditions and diseases and how they actually reverse that process and what it takes to get to that point, which is really, really helpful. And I know also from a bone health perspective, you know, our audience is, has a lot of people with osteopenia, osteoporosis that are focused on building stronger bones. And when they think about nutrition too, one of the most important components they're focused on is, or that we need to focus on is protein. And a lot of people just don't get enough protein in their their daily diets too. So um, what are some of your favorite sources of protein that you like to incorporate? Well, first of all, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of arguably, there's a lot, arguably too much politics in our world today, you know, in our political system. And uh, I, I don't talk politics, but even in nutrition, there's a weird politics about vegans versus carnivores. Vegans, of course, are people who only eat plants and carnivores are sort of the other extreme that only eat uh, animals. And I, I love vegans. I love carnivores. I was a vegan for 10 years myself. I, and I've, I've dabbled in carnivore. I, I support both both groups of people and everybody in the middle. I think you can live healthy anywhere on that dietary spectrum. You can also live unhealthily on that. The key thing is to avoid the junk foods. And there's there's a lot of junk vegan foods out there. And there's there's also junk carnivore foods, although our, it's harder to get junk foods in a meat diet, but you, you can still find them. So either one of those diets, I think, I think, uh, can be healthy. And uh, so I, I, I follow, you know, both of those, uh, depending on the situation. Yeah, of course. And I mean, everybody's obviously biochemically, genetically unique individuals, you're going to respond to different foods and supplements and dietary approaches differently. And a lot of people, if you're finding yourself in the middle, like, where do I go? Maybe the middle is the right place for you right? Maybe it doesn't have to be on the extreme ends of those spectrums, which is, that's just fine uh, too. And um, I, I'd love to understand maybe from a, from a lab perspective, or even from, are there any specific tests that you like to look at or biomarkers that you like to look at to evaluate someone's overall health, or maybe the future trajectory of their health? <laughs> yeah. And well, first of all, metabolic disease, a uh, uh, scientist, uh, Gerald Revin from uh, Stanford University, who's passed away now, but he described a, sim a syndrome called called Syndrome X, or eventually it was Metabolic Syndrome, which he he later acknowledged that it was basically insulin resistance. But there there are markers of this syndrome, which are hypertension, increased blood pressure, which you know, which I said half the people have, increased abdominal girth. That's that's the basically just the the measurement of your 
your abdomen right around right right around your belly button sort of and, and there are different measurements for men and women there but sadly you know most people in the united states most adults are overweight or obese you know it's just the nature of the thing so that's another factor and then there's factors of uh, abnormal glucose metabolism elevated glucose and then also elevation of certain fats like uh, triglycerides and uh, lowering of good fats like uh, blood fats like HDL cholesterol and those are those are some of the markers for for this metabolic syndrome other blood tests i look at uh i think we're you know, d despite what happened with Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos a few years ago in the Bay Area with, uh, you know, the idea of a finger stick with uh, all sorts of blood tests. Well, actually, I, I guess she's in prison now, but they're now companies that are doing what she had aspired to and 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 promised to do. The technology is changing. There's this one company I use has 22 blood markers from a single finger stick that you can do from home. Uh there's another one that has like 500 markers, but the types of things that I can test with this one blood test with a couple drops of blood, I, I do all my my fats, my triglycerides, my HDLs, they mentioned fasting glucose, fasting insulin, uh, hemoglobin, HA1C, those diabetes uh, markers. It also looks at uh, hormones, testosterone, looks at estradiol for women, it looks at fasting, cortisol. Uh, it's It's really amazing now. And I think these are going to be more and more widely available. I mean, you can get them through the mail now and just mail them in practically in any state yourself. You don't even need uh, a doctor's uh, help. It looks at also vitamin D levels, which will be important for bone health, homocysteine levels as well. So that's that's what I do. I do that about once a month just because I'm sort of a geek or a, a hacker and I like to I like to know what's going on under the hood and I'm constantly changing things. So, you know, probably too much so that I could never really be sure of what the results are, but, but I like to keep an eye on things and it's fun looking. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. If you're finding it helpful, please leave a positive rating and review. Hit that like button, subscribe to the podcast or the channel. That lets us help more people and reach and serve more people. And it also lets us know that this is helpful to you on your journey to better health and stronger bones. And then also, right down in the show notes, you can actually find a link to my free bone healthy recipes guide that's going to give you access to some amazing and delicious recipes to support your journey to stronger bones and then also we have a link to my free stronger bones masterclass in the show notes too and that is the three-step process that has helped people in over 1500 cities around the world get confident in their plan for stronger bones over 110,000 people have have taken part in this and it's been really really helpful for them and i want you to have free access to it too so add your name and email right down there in the show notes get access to that free stronger bones masterclass, and let's get you confident in your stronger bones plan today is there anything in the medical field or even the you know longevity space or anything like that 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 has you excited about the future that you're like I I see this coming I can't wait for it to happen? Yeah, I mean all of this this revolution about these chronic diseases uh all being driven by underlying inflammatory metabolic markers that can be addressed with longevity. I mean can be addressed with lifestyle and and the choices we make every single day that that the drugs really aren't the solution, but it's the lifestyle effects. Not that we shouldn't take the drugs. If we get prescribed a drug by our physician, we should take it. But if you do your lifestyle right, you may be able to get off those drugs. It's something called deprescription, which is what happened to me. But the, the things that I'm really excited about is if we take all these chronic diseases and we change our lifestyle, these chronic diseases are, guess what? These are the diseases that statistically you and I and every one of our listeners, or at least the majority of them, will die of. You can look at the causes of death, really what determines our longevity, and they are, number one, cardiovascular disease, heart attack and stroke, two, cancer, and then down the list, Alzheimer's disease, and and, and a few others. And the, the interesting thing is... These lifestyle changes, these metabolic improvements reduce our risk of all those diseases of longevity. So guess what happens? Our lifespans increase. And 
we're undergoing a amazing revolution in longevity and basically the ability not to just live longer, but to live healthier longer. I mean, nobody wants to live 10 extra years in a nursing home, right? But these are 10 extra years where you're doing push-ups and running with your kids and having fun. So, or your grandkids or your great grandkids. Uh, so that's, that's the thing that's really got me excited and these lifestyle things. And then now research is, just in the last five years, uh, pushing back even more things we can look towards with longevity, things like drugs like rapamycin or metformin for longevity or acarbose. Uh, we're looking at stem cells and exosomes. We're looking at partial epigenetic reprogramming where we reprogram our epigenome to control the expression of our genes. So we're born with genes, we're stuck with them, but through our lifestyle, and other techniques, we can reprogram the expression of the genes so we can literally change our future by the lifestyle choices we make today. It's so exciting. I can't believe it. This is the best time to be alive. <laughs> I love I love this. And I love your passion. I can definitely sense that coming through as well. Um, and I love what you said earlier. You, you said that uh, when you were talking about some of the lifestyle, you know, things that you had in the past, that you loved those things, but you loved your kids and your grandkids more. Or what you just mentioned there, which is maybe the the last 10, 20 years of your life are not you sitting in a, you know, a wheelchair or looking out the window, watching life pass you by. It's you're actually up, active, playing with those kids, playing with the grandkids, traveling, going on adventures, doing the things you love. The decisions you make today impact that. That is so, so important. It's uh, so... Thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and your expertise. Let's actually talk about your book uh, that's coming out in June 2024. Uh, I want to make sure we link to that in the show notes. I know you said you've got a chapter of the book. Maybe we can link to also, which is sure. fantastic. Free sample chapter, download. It's the first chapter. Read it if you like it. Get the book from your library or buy it. If you don't like it, don't buy the book. <laughs> but don't see, tell, you'll be able to try anybody. it out there. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I hope you like it. <laughs> no, it's going to be a phenomenal book. Um, and maybe you could share, uh, just give, give us an overview of the book. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, well, basically, the, the book encapsulates a lot of the stories that I've told. And, and kind of to end the story, uh, those four diseases, after changing my lifestyle, like like I talked about here and, and go into more detail in the book, I basically reversed all those four chronic diseases. I went in to see my doctor and they go, what, what happened? What did you do? You know, you don't need these prescriptions anymore. I'm off. You know, they basically canceled prescriptions. I don't have the diseases anymore or they are in remission, depending on how you define them. But I have, you know, it, it, it has a happy ending. So the book, the book goes through 12 chapters. It talks about lies, lies I taught in medical school. It starts with metabolism. And then it goes through things like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, things like fatty liver disease. And then it, it talks about cancer, talks about Alzheimer's disease. We even have a chapter on mental health, which is kind of, you know, people don't think of mental health as being related to metabolic disease, but there's strong evidence that, that it is. And even psychiatric conditions, some of them can be reversed with a ketogenic diet. So we talk about that and then we end up with longevity and uh, talk about some of these amazing things that are being done. And then finally, I just give some suggestions of what I do and uh, my thoughts there. That's fantastic. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes. I want to thank you again for your time, uh, Dr. Rob. And uh, for everybody listening, you can find all of the resources, show notes, everything mentioned here today over at bonecoach.com. We'll make sure we link to that in the show notes. And uh, is there any other resources you want to point to in the show notes before we before we close this out? Wow. Uh, go to my website. Uh, if you're interested, we have uh, different resources on there. We talk about the, the at-home blood test if they want that. That's the, the information about that's available on it. So uh, yeah, it's uh, robertlufkinmd.com is the website. Perfect. So we'll link to that as well. So for everybody listening, I want to thank you again so much for your time. We'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, 
head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. It's going to tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your bone coach, Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.